Hi, this is Sarit Schwetzer, and welcome to the It Is Taught podcast, a podcast devoted to the teachings of Rabbi Schneer Zalman of Liadi, as recorded in his most famous work, the Tanya. My hope for this show is to make these teachings accessible and relatable to the average person, regardless of prior Jewish education or affiliation. The episodes follow the prescribed daily study portions and are meant to serve as practical lessons in how to live your life as your true self and develop an authentic and powerful relationship with your Creator. I have personally experienced the effects the study of this work has had on me, and I'm excited to share what I can of this knowledge with you. So please join me on this journey of learning, self-growth, and connection with your source. Hi, and welcome to the It Is Top podcast. This is episode 653 for the 20th of Elul in a regular year. So the subject of today's episode is going to be all about the makeup of the divine soul. So if you've been following all, along that the uh, these podcasts for a while, you'll recall in the very beginning of the Tanya in Sefer Shel Benanim, we talked about this idea that a Jew doesn't just have one soul, but we actually have two souls. We have what's known as an animal soul, and then we have a godly soul, a divine soul. Now, when we first hear the word animal soul, that might sound very like nasty, like you know, not so nice kind of thing. But we've actually learned that the animal soul is not that bad. And it can actually be capable of a lot of good. And kind of a better way to understand the animal soul is to think of it as the human soul, as the ego, as the part of ourselves that is out there for our own pleasure, for our own happiness, uh, for our own comfort, just like an animal. An animal seeks all these things. So animals we see also are not necessarily always going around killing one another. They're, they're often very loving, very giving creatures, but, uh, but it's coming from a place of ego. It's coming from a place of self because it feels good to them. So that's really what the animal soul is all about. The divine soul, on the other hand, is the part of us that's an actual part of God. And it's, and, and being that it's seeing as it's an actual part of God, what that means is that its whole entire desire is just to cleave to God is it's selfless. It doesn't have its own needs, its own desires and that kind of thing. And throughout our lives, as we've learned, there's this constant struggle between these two things. There's, they're constantly at war because what the, animal soul wants is not necessarily what the godly soul wants. Like your ego might not necessarily want what God wants of you, what's ultimately for your own good. An example that comes to mind for me for this is, let's say you have a big day ahead of you. There's a lot you got to do, a lot of mitzvahs you got to accomplish, um, go, and you also have to go to work. You have you have to daven, you have all these things. And you, you, you wake up in the morning, your alarm clock wakes you up at six o'clock in the morning. The animal soul wants you to keep sleeping. You want to keep sleeping and it's so comfortable in your bed. Uh, you tell yourself, you know, sleep is really good for your body. It's really rejuvenating and it's just so comfortable. It's so nice there. Everything. Uh, maybe what will get you up is you smell coffee and that coffee is going to make you like a little bit more excited to get up. Those are all animal soul functions. The godly soul part of you, when that alarm clock goes off, it's going to be so excited to get out of bed, to start davening, to start praying to God, to start on your day, to thinking about all the things that you need to accomplish that will bring godliness here into this world. All the mitzvahs you can do today. It's a really exciting thing. It doesn't care about the coffee. It doesn't care about the comfort of the bed, that kind of thing. Now, the interesting thing is that whereas for most of us, we have this internal struggle going on between these two things, there are certain people as we've learned, otherwise known as tzaddikim, uh, who they don't have this conflict. They're not at war in this way, where the animal soul is totally subjugated to the divine soul, whether it's just sleeping and it's dormant and it's not there anymore, or in the case of very great tzaddikim, where they actually have succeeded in transforming their animal souls to the point that the animal soul does have desires, does have cravings, does have passions, but those desires and cravings and passions are the same as that that divine soul. So in the case of a tzaddik like that, they will wake up in the morning and they're 
physical body will want to wake up in the morning. It won't just be like a spiritual feeling. It actually will be a physical sensation that it will feel good to them to get out of bed in that way. Maybe they'll still want that coffee because they want to say that bracha on the coffee. They want to say a blessing on the coffee and elevate the coffee beans. And their physical body gets excited about praying to God, gets excited about doing all these mitzvahs. So there's, there's a synchronicity between the divine soul and the animal soul. So this level of synchronicity, this level of becoming a tzaddik, we've learned already is not necessarily accessible to everybody. Uh, the most that most of us can do is really to become aware of these two forces within us and to try to just overcome the animal soul as best possible and not let it take over as best possible and we've learned about how the struggle itself is really essential and it's really that's kind of the whole point even if we don't always win the war if we're fighting the war that's really what it's all about um and so yeah so that's kind of like just like a nice review to, to give you guys just context for what it is that we're going to be learning about today so coming into today's episode the focus of today's episode is as i mentioned going to be giving us an outline of the divine soul and the way that we're going to examine this the outline of the divine soul is by actually looking at by actually um looking back at the past couple of episodes where we looked at the topography of emotions, we called it. We looked at the makeup of the human being in a general sense. So we didn't mention it at the time, but when we were talking about if we, the past two episodes ago and yesterday's episode as well, we were talking about the fact that there are different personality type systems and how all different personality type systems are all really trying to get to the root, like core building blocks of the human being, personality wise, emotion wise, all of those things. And we talked about how Torah has a perspective on this as well. Tanya, Chassidus, Kabbalah, all of that. And we gave the, the Torah perspective on that, the different the different midos, the different attributes that make up human emotion. And so what we didn't mention then, but we're going to mention it today, is that all of that stuff, we want to put it into the broader like context of Hasidic terminology. All of those emotions that we learned about are all emotions of the animal soul, or also sometimes called the nefesh hasichlis, the, the intellectual soul, the human soul, in other words. But what we'll learn about today is that, as mentioned, we have another soul. We have a divine soul. And not only do we have a divine soul, but actually all of these emotions that we learned about in terms of the, the intellectual soul, the human soul, the animal soul, are actually only there to serve as a metaphor for these deeper and more like essential emotions that we have as Jews within our divine soul. So they're kind of there to teach us how to serve God in different ways on an interesting level. So like, what do we mean by this? So for example, so we talked about, uh, we talked about how there's external emotions and then we talked about how there's internal emotions. The external emotions are chesed, giving, gvura, restraint, rachamim, compassion, et cetera. And there, there's a whole bunch of them that we talked about. Um, but then we talked about how there's these internal emotions, these internal emotions of love and fear and how those are kind of like the essential emotions that are like the forefront. They're the origin of all other human emotions. Like if we think about emotions and we think about our, our emotions in terms of uh, somebody relating to somebody who's close to us. So we talked about like a father with a son, for example. So how does the father express his love towards his son? is he might hug him, he might give him presents, he might teach him things, things like that, right? And then on the other hand, towards the same son, the father might have a certain sense of fear. What does that mean, being fear? It's not that he's scared of his child, but he's scared for him. He wants to protect him. And in that sense, he's going to shield him from certain things that he doesn't want his son to know or that he doesn't want his son to be uh, to, to come into contact with. Like he might put like plastic covers over the plugs around the house if the child is is young enough so as not to hurt him and that kind of thing right so what we'll learn about today is that all of these emotions with again love and fear being like the primary ones of all of them are really just mirrors really just windows into understanding our divine self the emotions of our divine self and which is ultimately there to serve god it's all about how to serve God. And we serve God through these different emotions. So we're going to go back to these emotions. So it's a good opportunity to review what these emotions are. And we're going to understand them from a deeper and higher perspective this time, looking at them, not just in terms of 
human activities and things that are fulfilling towards ourselves, but actually in terms of how they can be utilized in the service of God and how they are utilized in the service of God in the case of the divine soul. So let's get into the text and see how the altar but explains all of this. And for context, we're going to be continuing with Epistle 15 today of Igeris HaKodesh. So here we go. So this, so the altar Rebbe begins and he says that all of this, meaning everything we've learned so far about this map of the emotions, and we also got into the intellect a little bit. Yesterday was the focus on the intellect. All of this is just to be understood by way of analogy. Why? Because this is all within the rational soul, the intellectual soul, the nefesh sichlis it's called in Hebrew. And this is the lower soul within a person that comes from the place of klipas noga. So klipas noga, again, just brief re review. We've talked about klipas noga quite a bit here, but klipas noga is a husk. It's a translucent husk. It's like kind of like the liter literal translation of it. But the idea is that there are certain things in the world that God set up that conceal him for all kinds of different purposes. And those are what are known as klipos. Those are known as husks, just like a husk, like a shell of a, of a fruit or of a nut or something like that. And some of those klipos are totally, um, opaque like they are just we're it's we're incapable they're incapable of of radiating godliness at least at this time but then there are some husks that are translucent these are what are known as klipas noga these are things in the world that we can think of as being like more kind of neutral territory they don't embody godliness and holiness like in their own right just in kind of like a natural way they're there they're there and they're kind of waiting for us to uncover and unlock the godliness that's inherent within them so these would constitute all the different objects in the world all the different types of food and things like that that are kosher that are there that we can use for mitzvahs but that are not like things we have to use for mitzvahs like not like a safer torah or something like that you know it would be more like the an animal who has skin that we can turn into leather to turn into a safer Torah would be an example of a klipas noga. So anyway, so another example of a klipas noga is the nefesh sichlis, the intellectual rational soul, right? Because this is the part of the soul. This is the part of a person, again, that could be used for godly purposes, but could also not be used for godly purposes. So it's sort of like neutral territory. But the truth is, continues the Alter Rebbe, the higher soul, so we have that lower soul and then we have the higher soul. The higher soul, which is the godly soul, is an actual part of God. In Hebrew, it's chelek elokam imal. It's an actual part of God. And so all of the attributes that we talked about, all of these emotive attributes, whether we're talking about the internal attributes or the external attributes within the divine soul, they're all for God. They're all for the sake of God. The, their entire direction is towards God. So how can we understand this? So basically because the divine soul, it loves God so much. Its whole entire focus is on God. So out of its great love for God and out of its great desire to cleave to God, because it recognizes that its source is in God and it wants to really just cleave to its source, then it will want to do chesed, it will want to do goodness in order to uh, to cleave to God's attributes. So, so right? So ultimately, so just kind of like to explain that. So ultimately, all of these attributes that we've been talking about are really ultimately analogies for God. Remember, we talked about a few episodes ago about how we can come to understand God through looking at man. So all of these attributes that we're talking about are really just mirror images to God to the ultimate attributes above, which are God, godly. So for the divine soul, the divine soul wants to cleave to God. The divine soul wants to attach to God, wants to become nullified with God, wants to really just put all of their energies towards God. So how are they going to do that? So they're going to recognize the fact that chesed, chesed is this, is a very godly trait. It's a very godly quality. It's kind of like the, um, the quintessential godly trait, at least in terms of how we relate to God. So this is going to motivate the god the godly soul within a person to want to do chesed want to do kindness because they're going to want to emulate god and they recognize that by emulating god this is a way that they can actually come to cleave to god as the uh, as the sages taught uh and this is a citation from devarim chapter 11 verse 22 and to cleave to him and how do we and the way that what the sages taught what this means how do we cleave to God is cleaving to his attributes. So it's like, if we want to be close to God, then we, then we emulate him. We emulate his attributes. So, okay. So that's the attribute of chesed, right? And that's, if you remember in the topography of the emotions, that's on the top 
right side, um, in, in, in the, like the right corner kind of at the top. And it's the first emotion that we spoke about. Then we have the attribute of Gvura. That's the second one. Gvura is this idea of might, of, um, restraint of judgment of harshness there's a harshness there so how is could this be connected to the divine soul the divine soul is supposed to be like all about light and and all of that right so where where can we see this harshness where can we see this restraining energy within the divine soul so this becomes manifest in the divine soul uh punishing and chastising wicked people uh, with the punishments of the Torah. So we know that the Torah does, it's not so politically correct to talk about, but there are punishments that are outlined in the Torah. And so these things should be enforced. Uh, right now we don't have a base of Mekdash, so it's not super um, practical, but still there should be, like we, we shouldn't just be overly accepting of everything. There is room for judgment within the, the godly soul is the point. And also not only is there room for judgment of, for on the outside, but also within the person within the person to be able to overcome over their evil inclination and to sanctify themselves with that which is permitted to them. So, right, so we spoke about just before this this battle, this internal battle that we have going on between the divine soul and the God and the animal soul. And so the the attribute of Gvura within the divine soul is what allows a person to overcome their animal soul and to hold them back from doing anything that's against the will of God. And not only doing something that's against the will of God, but actually to keep themselves refined even in the realm of doing the world of God. So that would mean that, let's say you're eating a meal and the meal is totally 100% kosher. You set a bracha on the food, so no problem. You can eat the whole thing if you want to. But are you going to eat that meal like a glutton? Are you going to eat past the point of satiation? Or will you eat it with a div divine awareness? Will you eat it in a more sanctified way? Will you stop maybe when you're not hungry anymore? These are things that are the Gvora attribute of your divine soul is going to help you in doing this. And also, what's another thing that the Gvora aspect of the divine soul can do? It can set up a barrier and a fence around the Torah. So these are things that this comes up, you know, in a lot of different ways that it's sort of like we have the letter of the law of the Torah. And then there's like this idea of like, okay, there's certain things that we're technically permitted to do, but it might be a good idea to kind of like, you know, set up a fence for yourself. So not to put yourself in a, in a situation that might become more tempting to you to sin. Right. So for each person, this is going to be something else. So if you know, for example, that there's like a certain like environment that if you go into that environment certain friends of yours that you have maybe even or certain um yeah certain music that you listen to or certain movies that you might watch or something like that that might lead you towards a path of god forbid falling and not being as connected to god as you could be then that would be another way that your that the gvora within your divine soul would manifest would be to set up these boundaries for yourself to say you know what i know i'm technically allowed to watch that movie i'm technically allowed to go to that place listen to that music or whatever but i'm gonna i'm gonna set up these boundaries and some of these boundaries were actually set up by the the sages themselves because they knew about human nature in order to prevent um yourself from being put in a situation that might be too tempting for you um and this all comes from a place of fearing god and having awe of god um uh, to uh and and fearing fearing go, getting into a place of sin. So it's like for the divine soul, the most fearful, the most traumatic type of thing that could happen to them is God forbid sinning. So they want to do anything they can to prevent themselves from sinning. So just like when we talked about the attribute of Gura with the father and the son, that the father fears for the son, the father fears that their son is going to touch the electrical attribute. Uh, outlet or is going to be exposed, exposed to things that will be harmful for the, him, things like that. So he's going to prevent him from doing anything like that or being exposed to those kind of things. So to here, it's like in the case of the divine soul, the biggest fear of the divine soul is for the divine soul to be disconnected from God in the form of sinning, God forbid. So that is going to prevent a person from getting anywhere near sin at all. Okay, now we have, so we did the first two attributes, the attribute of chesed, and we did gvura on the left upper corner. Now we have the attribute of tiferet, the attribute of, of, of rachamim, of glory, right? That's the third one, the beauty, sometimes it's called. So what does that mean? How does that translate into, uh, into 
the divine soul. This is beautifying the God and beautifying his Torah with all kinds of different glorif gloriful ways. So it's like if you might buy a really, really nice um, sitter, a really nice Sefer Torah, you might sing a really nice song on Shabbos to go together with different uh, brachas you do, brachat mazan, things like that. You buy really beautiful clothes for Shabbos or Yom Tov. You make yourself look beautiful for the sake of the Shabbos or the sake of the Yom Tov. So all of this is in order, again, to cleave to God through his praises and with all the aspects, all the faculties of a person's soul. So God's praises are also an aspect of the beautifying of God that, you know, when when you, we talk about God and all his glory and all praising God in all these ways. So when a person really focuses their mind and their thoughts and also their speech on these things of praising God, this is another way that they can tap into this attribute of the tiferet, of the glorification, the beauty of, of the divine soul. Okay, then what do we have right after that? Then we have the aspect of the nitzachon, the netzach one, right? That's the one that's lower on the right-hand side of... Um, uh, 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 on the right hand side that's that's lower down below Tiferet so what does that translate into so Netzach again is endurance it's also translated as winning as victory so it's be, being victorious against anything that holds a person back from serving God and from cleaving to God so this is what's going to make a person be, really be like strong and and not give up in spite of any kind of outside pressures for anything so this reminds me of people who in the past they went to such great lengths uh, our ancestors went to such great lengths just to toivel in a mikvah you know or just to in the holocaust jews they went to such great lengths to find matzah and pesach to find a menorah something that they could do this is the netzach this is the part of them that is real that is going to make you prevail that's going to make you really push forward to keep these mitzvahs to do the mitzvahs no matter what and against anything that might be restraining you um and this could be something and nowadays you can think about this let's say uh you have you're in a situation and it's really difficult for you to find a minion but you really want to find a minion to daven with if you're a man you're going to really go at great lengths you're not going to just like uh, look in one or two places. You're going to look around until you can find that minion. Um, for a woman, that could be something like you want to find nice sneeze clothing and you find some clothing and it's kind of sneeze, but not 100% sneeze or whatever. And you're like, yeah, it might be good enough. No, the netzach part of you is going to be persistent and keep enduring and keep looking for those clothing, for that good clothing that's going to help you manifest your being in a godly and divine way. And not only will this Netzach uh, give you this endurance to be able to serve God and, and go against uh, and push away anything that is against the service of God, but it's actually going to push away anything that is deterring the glory of God to fill the entire world. So this power of endurance within the divine soul, the godly soul, is really there to really just push away anything that is preventing God manifesting here in this world. So it's like a, a the it we can liken it says the Alter Rebbe to the the wars of God that David of Melech that King David fought for the sake of God like the wars that King David fought for the sake of God those were coming from a place of Netzach. And so too when we bow down to God and when we praise God this is also from in, coming from the divine soul. So this is now, the altar has actually moved on to the next attribute. Uh, it, this is the attribute of hood, the attribute of humility. So this is where we make ourselves humble before God. And we recognize the fact that God vivifies and brings into being everything. And that everything is nullified in existence before him. And everything exists as if not and like nothingness before him. And even though this isn't something that we can truly, truly understand that everything is like nothingness before God, like it's something we say, but do we really understand it? Nevertheless, we really, we admit this and we acknowledge it uh, with a true acknowledgement, a true humility that this is a true truth. And included in this is the idea of, of praising God for uh, and offering thanks to, for all of God's midos, all of God's attributes, and all of God's action in all of the worlds, whether it's the world of Atsilas or, or and um, and in the and the creation of the higher worlds and the lower worlds, to recognize that they are praiseworthy to no end. So, in, in another nosach, in another rendition of this book, it's praiseworthy to no understanding beyond our understanding. So it's like sort of like this, like 
humble appreciation and acknowledgement of God. And we realize that these praises are uh, very fitting to God and that they, and, and uh, who's so blessed and so exalted. And this is the phraseology that corresponds to this is this comes from Tehillim chapter 104, verse one, Hod Vadar, majesty and splendor. So there's this like splendor aspect of it. And so this is all coming from that attribute of hood within uh, within the divine soul. So hood again is like the left side at the, on the bottom underneath. So we likened the netzach and hood to the testicle. So I guess it would be the left testicle. Um, now we're coming to the next one, the yesod. Yesod is the one that's underneath netzach and hood, the one that is that um, is in the middle beneath that. So for the attribute of Yesod, the Altar Rebbe brings the uh, citation from Mishle, chapter 10, verse 25, where it says, Tzadik Yesod Olam. The Tzadik is the foundation of the world. So there's this, there's the Tzadik is often likened to the attribute of Yesod. So why? Because the Tzadik, his soul is connected to God, the life of all life, and, uh, and to cleave to God with and his whole cleaving of God. The tzaddik is all about cleaving to God and yearning for God with a great yearning and a great pleasure. So this is what, this is the idea of yesod. So yesod is kind of like the pinnacle. So again, if we're talking about this idea of the divine soul and we're talking about how the divine soul is really all about the tzaddik because the tzaddik is is the one who embodies the divine soul fully and completely. So the Yesod is very much tied to the Tzadik because Yesod is all about connection. It's all about um, really fusing with the other outside of the self. And there's an aspect of longing, of yearning with that. So we liken this in the episode where we talked about these emotions in more human terms to the father who wants to give over the knowledge to his son. So it's not just about him knowing a lot and knowing how to give over the knowledge. You need to have that passion there, that passion and that yearning, that desire for his son to know. That's what's going to motivate him. That's what's going to infuse the knowledge and make it palatable, make it connect with the son, make the son internalize it. We also likened it to the act of intimacy that this is, there's, there's something uh, sexual about the yesod. It's often, it's often, um, associated with sexuality with intimacy and the and the idea there is that for the for the male in order to connect with the female in an intimate way there needs to be a desire there there needs to be it's 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 not just a physical thing but it's actually there's something very passionate happening on um on a deeper level so that's the idea of the yisod here so okay so now we're coming to malchus so interestingly i think this is fascinating that when we talked about the human emotions if you recall we actually left out the attribute of malchus we didn't talk about it and the ultra rabbit didn't give an explanation for this as to why it was left out if any of the listeners happen to know why if you have if you know why this is then i'd love to hear about that maybe you can leave it in the comments in youtube um and and write something about that there because i think that's really interesting especially in light of the fact that here when it comes to the divine soul the ultra rabbit actually does bring up the attribute of malchus and so he talks about that in the divine soul what is the this attribute of malchus this is the malchus is kingship sovereignty so this is t accepting upon a person the yoke of the kingship of heaven so and the service of god like uh, the service of a servant to his master with great fear so it's basically it's like an acknowledgement of god being our king it's an acknowledgement of the fact that god is our sovereign king and i'm going to serve him just like a, a servant would serve his master so those are the seven godly attributes as they're manifest within in the divine soul so that's the end of the section for today and tomorrow we will continue along these lines when we explore the three intellectual attributes of the divine soul which as you recall when we talked about uh the the human the the animal soul that the the emotions stem from the intellects we'll see how it works very similarly when it comes to the divine soul so stay tuned for that and i will speak to you then thanks for listening to the it is top podcast hosted by sarit switzer this podcast is dedicated in loving memory of my maternal grandfather abraham yitzhak ben binyamin cohen of blessed memory music by shoshana if you enjoyed this episode and would like to support the show, please share it with others and subscribe on YouTube, Apple iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And make sure to leave us a five-star review. 
To find out more about the It Is Taught project, including more information on my soon-to-be-published book, please visit our website, itistaught.com. To catch the latest from me, follow me on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Looking forward to speaking with you tomorrow, and until then, have a great day.